Aynen. Good morning, everybody. Or afternoon. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So I guess it's 12 o'clock, so we'll get started right on time. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here to this wonderful uh, webinar, Creating an Equitable Course Outline of Record. My name is Anwar Hijaz, and I'm a faculty um, support at CBC, and I'm also a faculty member at Saddleback College. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitators today. We have Briella Plump and Neely Kushner. Briella has been an adjunct faculty member in communication studies at multiple community colleges and state universities in California since 2016. Recently, her passion for creating innovative and equitable classroom experiences led her to pursue professional development and distance education. She is currently uh, has an additional appointment as an instructional designer at UC Santa Cruz. Her favorite topic to teach are intercultural communication, health communications, because they allow her to weave principles of diversity and inclusion, not only in her pedagogy, but also in the curriculum. She believes that the classrooms are spaces for collaboration, growth, and community building. Neely um, is a professor of sociology and has served as curriculum chair at Woodland Community Colleges for over, uh, College for over a decade. As a member of the California Community College Curriculum Committee, Neely helped develop DEI and curriculum model principles and practices. So just a little bit of um, important information on this webinar. During the webinar, we will be linking um, you all to a survey to provide feedback. We'll be dropping the link to the survey 30 minutes into the webinar, and then every 15 minutes after that. We ask that you please fill out the survey to let us know how we did and to help us create more programming that is tailored to the needs um, of everyone. Lastly, while At One offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide badges for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete the survey and request a copy of your responses to be sent through the Google form. You can use that as confirmation as your proof of attendance. Thank you all and we will get started, yeah. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you so much. Appreciate that warm welcome and really want to thank everyone for being here today on this Friday. There's a lot of other things that you could be doing um, and we really appreciate you joining us for this important presentation and this important discussion about curriculum outlines of record and DEI. Um, so before we go any further, I want to take a moment just to acknowledge where I'm currently located in Los Angeles, California. And as a resident of South Los Angeles, I recognize that I occupy land that was originally and is still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva and Kizba people. I honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. I'm going to read my land acknowledgement too, but for those of you, if you um, are not familiar with the tribes in your area, you can use the link that we are going to post in the chat. Um, if you are familiar with your tribes and would like to acknowledge them, you can use the chat um, to enter your land acknowledgement. In Woodland, I live and work on land that for thousands of years has been the home of the Putwin people who have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes. Kachil Dihi Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzel Dihi Wintun Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. Thank you for pausing to honor ancestral grounds and supporting the resilience, strength, history, and traditions of indigenous people worldwide. Great. And now just a, a little bit more of an introduction of who will be sharing information with you today. So my name is Brielle Arike or Brielle Plump. And um, I'm really excited to be able to talk with you all today about diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the course outline of record. 
I appreciate CBC um, OEI so much for inviting us to speak on this topic. And I wanna thank them for the intro they gave in the beginning of our presentation today all about my background. And all that I wanna to add to what was shared earlier is that um, in addition to teaching as a communication studies faculty member at several community colleges and now working as an instructional designer, I've also held some appointments specifically as related to equity and inclusion in online classrooms, most notably with Peralta Community College. And Peralta Community College is located in the Bay Area in Oakland, California. And um, they have a really innovative program as it relates to equity and supporting staff and training staff on how to be more uh, equitable in their instruction. And that is really serviced by the Peralta Online Equity Rubric, which I had the chance to train faculty members on and train staff on train, like train the trainers um, so that we could sort of pay that forward and keep up the legacy of implementing that rubric throughout our curriculum um, across the district. And that rubric has since been adopted by many other districts. Perhaps you've heard of it. I'll be sure to provide a link in the chat later for those of you that are curious. But just wanted to share a little bit more about that specific part of my background because um, it, it provides some context to how I arrived at this conversation today. And I know my colleague will share a little bit more about their background now. Thanks, Brielle. Um, I'm also really uh, happy to be here today. Um, my name is Neely Kirshner. As you can see, I'm a professor of sociology uh, at Woodland Community College, one of the smallest community colleges in the state, I think, a pretty tiny little one up in Northern California. Um, I have always kind of been interested in, in DEI um, initiatives before we really called it that. Going into sociology, my interest was always um, social justice studies type things. And it wasn't until I got hired as a full-time faculty member that I even had curriculum, course outlines of record, anything like that on the radar. I came in as a new faculty member, all bright-eyed and ready to revise my curriculum and didn't understand some of the implications of the COR and, and learned the hard way that the, the paperwork part is important, not just what we do in the classroom. So that's how I kind of got interested in curriculum and more recently um, DEI work through my work with um, the Academic Senate of California Community Colleges. I've served on their curriculum committee for oh, six or seven years, um, help organize the Curriculum Institute for some many of those years, and um, 5C, which is the California Community Colleges Curriculum Committee. So through that, I've been able to do um, a lot of work on integrating um, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism into our curriculum regulations, into our guidelines, and into our practices. Did you did you want to talk about the poll? Or, okay, all right. So we are going to use Mentimeter to do a little bit of a poll. We'd like to know, I can see that there are lots of participants in here, but uh, we want to know a little more about who's in the room and experience level. So we have a QR code on the screen. Um, if that doesn't work or you don't want to use that, you can go to menti.com. At least it's a short URL and enter the code that you see on the screen. And it'll when you enter it right now, it'll say it's waiting for me to change slides because we do have a, a few more polls that we want to do at the end. So if you are using two devices and you want to keep the, the screen up, we'll come back to it at the end. Otherwise, we'll provide the code again later. Um, I'm going to switch views for a second, but we'll, we'll bring the, the code back up. I've got too many screens going. Brielle, is it looking right? We've still got the code up. Yep, you're looking right. good. And I'm gonna add okay. the um, URL and code to the chat for anyone that um, okay. it'll be easier for you to, to participate that way. Um, we really appreciate, we see folks giving us thumbs up. That kind of lets us know how many people are in there. So if you can give us the thumbs up when we see that we've got a good amount of people in there, we'll advance the slide. And it's also just such a nice mood boost to see all those little colorful thumbs up float across the screen. All right. So we'll give people just a little bit longer. Real, I think I'm going to advance the screen because the code still appears uh, on the next slide. And that way, some of the folks that are in can start answering our questions. So this is our pre-webinar poll. And then, as I said, we'll ask some more questions at the end. Now I feel insecure. Nobody's answered yet. 
Ah, there we go. <laughs> Just took a second to load, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for participating. Please continue to do so. Um, and just know that throughout the presentation, we will um, invite you to dialogue with us in chat. Um, it may be a difficult difficult at times for us to multitask, but we do want to encourage you to participate in any way that feels comfortable for you today. Um, and we will leave some time at the end of the presentation for live questions and answers. So this is just one of the many ways that we wanna keep you engaged and hear from you. All right, it looks like still not everybody, but we're getting kind of a sense when I hover over, there's a pretty broad range. We've got some folks that have very little experience and folks with a lot of experience in curriculum development, uh, DEI initiatives, familiarity, kind of most folks so far hovering in the middle, but we've got the full range and level of comfort. Um, it's nice to see people are skewing more towards feeling pretty comfortable with it, but we're, we've got a wide range. So um, we appreciate your patience with us as we go through this. We may, um, we're going to try to meet all needs, right? So make sure that we're defining key terms and not using jargon for the folks that are new to some of this stuff. Um, it might be review for some of you. And then we'll try to leave time to get in the weeds for the folks that are very comfortable with it and want to. I think we're we're pretty good. I haven't seen any changes to it. That gives us a, a good idea. If everybody said they were an expert in curriculum, I might try to speed a few slides up, but that that's not what happened. So, all right, uh, let's see. Moment here. All right. All right, thank you again for participating. So um, hopefully you feel like you're in the right room um, because these are gonna be our learning outcomes after today's presentation. So regardless of where you fall as far as experience with the topics that we're gonna cover today, know that our goals are to define the terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism and describe their importance as it relates to curriculum development specifically. We're also going to define what is the course outline of record and identify whose responsibility is it to update and create this document and sort of distinguish it as separate from the syllabus, which you might be more familiar with. And we'll also identify key areas of the COR where DEIA can be integrated. And hopefully um, along that journey, you can share what your knowledge is as it relates to these learning outcomes, but um, we we'll, won't waste any time and we're going to kind of dive right in uh, and start with those definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And, you know, it's, it's not my style to read off of a slide, but with this particular, these particular terms, I think it really is important to really think about what exactly are we talking about? Because so often these words are used interchangeably and they actually are quite distinct. So diversity focuses on the myriad of ways in which people differ and the proposition that everyone in every group should be valued. So we're talking about celebrating the way in which everybody is different. Equity focuses on providing resources and access to the same opportunities so that everybody can have the same opportunity, particularly as it, um, as it lends itself to learning, um, since we're here to talk about equity within the space of education. And we're talking about fairness, not sameness, because again, we're acknowledging through our understanding of diversity that everybody's different, right? So equity is a way for us to ensure everyone has the same opportunities despite those differences. Inclusion is authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into the processes, activities, and decision and policy making in a way that shares power. That is not something that has always been historically done within academic institutions. And um, it is really something that we're passionate about making sure happens now as we talk about um, the COR as a vehicle for change. And then finally, anti-racism is actively opposing racism and the unfair treatment of people who belong to other races. It requires identifying, challenging, and upending existing racist policies to replace them with anti-racist policies that foster equity between racial groups. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's about specifically countering racist practices. 
um, and some of those historical practices that are embedded within institutions. So that's the common language that we'll be using um, throughout today's presentation. Um, just wanna make sure we're all on the same page there. And you know, this slide, why focus on DEIA kind of makes me giggle. I wanna say like, why wouldn't we, right? Like we are all educators within the state of California, which is an incredibly diverse state, um, which for me is how it's always felt and always been and such a privilege. Um, and because we are serving specifically within the community college system, we are one of the higher largest higher education systems in the US and the most diverse because of that. So why wouldn't we be thinking about creating equity, inclusion, and being anti-racist as we celebrate diversity? Wouldn't make a lot of sense if we were intending to serve our students, right? Um, we serve students in communities that are both diverse and disproportionately low income and first generation. So when we think about diversity, we want to be thinking about um, lots of demogra demographics. We're not just talking about race, right? We're talking about so many different um, ways in which experiences and backgrounds of our students differ. Another reason why we really want to focus on DEIA right now is um, in response to some of the national events that have occurred over the past couple of years, and specifically the chancellor's office issued a call to action for community college systems to uphold these values. Um, and we really wanna to rise to that, to that call. Campuses legally must audit classroom climate and create an action plan to create inclusive classrooms and anti-racist curriculum. So this is something that we're doing, I hope out of passion, um, I hope because it it why not right? How could you how could you operate otherwise? But also because we've been called to do so um, by our leadership. And it's for everybody, right? DEI is a celebration, um, or it should be in celebration of everybody, um, all disciplines, no matter what you teach or what area of the academic institution you have a role in. Um, there is a space for you to think about DEIA. And all disciplines have areas of controversy, right? They have maybe some shadows in their history. And we're here to encourage you today to not shy away from that, um, to think about how you present information in ways that acknowledge why in the past, perhaps certain voices were left out, what is the historical and cultural context of some of the topics that you're teaching? Being explicit about racist, sexist, or biased assumptions that exist within the history of your disciplines or respective roles. And recognizing that all of the words that you use, all of the pictures that you use, all of the ways that you present information to students really do matter. And a big overarching question you can ask yourself when you're updating your COR or any other element of your class is who and what is represented and who is left out? Who's marginalized? Who's invisible? Um, and those are just some big picture ideas that we want to begin with as we start uh, diving a little bit deeper into the COR. Oh, this is me. All right. So what is a COR? Every once in a while, we get some confusion about the difference between a COR and a syllabus, and Brielle's gonna say more about that contrast in a bit. But briefly, the course outline of record or COR, I guess some people say core, but I usually just say COR, because core, I don't know, means other stuff. Um, it is a legally binding document, and the point of it, it is that it's course level data that is used to make sure that the the content, every everything about the course is sort of standardized across different um, sections of the course, across different instructors, and across different modalities um, to ensure compliance. And that's one of the things that's really interesting about our community college system is that four years don't have CORs, right? I mean, they, ha they have a course in the catalog, and then the professors can do whatever they want, you know, academic freedom, they do whatever they want within their syllabus. But the thing is that they don't have to ensure um, transfer. <laughs> and articulation between different systems. And the, 
the four, the four years don't have to do that, but we do. And so we have to have a little bit more standardization about some minimum requirements. And these are codified in Title V of the California Code of Regulations. We've got the section there and the exact language. I won't read it all to you, but it does say which elements need to be in there. And then all the instructors um, who teach this course in any section, any modality have to honor those minimums. And then within our academic freedom and our areas of expertise, we can we can tweak it and add to it. Um, so it's not completely prescriptive, but it does set those minimum standards. And it is the basis for CID approval. If you're doing you know, transfer model curriculum and you want to create a transfer degree, it's the basis for articulation agreements with the CSU and UC system. That they decide if the course is going to count within a major um, or or approving it for uh, transfer GE or Cal Getsy's coming up, right? Um, and so the COR is not just an individual faculty member's creation. An individual faculty member may start doing it, but it has to go through the college curriculum committee and it gets reviewed broadly. We'll talk more about that on the next slide. Uh, and so the college uh, curriculum committee and the district board of trustees approves it and the state chancellor's office chapters it and it is official. So one of the questions that we sometimes get is uh, why, so what, you know, why focus on the COR then if it's this like paperwork that just exists somewhere and it's not the syllabus, um, isn't that where all the important stuff happens in the classroom? And I've actually had people say that during um, talks about this, like who cares about the COR, it's busy work. Um, and well, I'll tell you the official stance of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, which represents uh, full-time and part-time faculty in our system, is that we should be um, we should be doing this. We should be including DEIA on it. It's important um, because it has ripple effects. So I, I kind of alluded in the beginning that I, when I first started, I kind of didn't know to care about the COR. And so I made some changes and I, I, I glossed over some parts and uh, I don't want to get too far into it, but basically I, I didn't understand how the articulation agreement worked. And we offered a class that before it was approved by UCs for transfer. And so students took it and it wasn't retroactive. You know, that stuff matters. It has ripple effects beyond that though. It, it It's really important for new instructors and sometimes for level setting for more experienced instructors about what the expectations are of the course. It can kind of help people be forced to keep current in their field. Um, transfer institutions, as I've said, will look at that. That is how they determine equivalency. And some parts of it actually are student facing. Um, and so we'll talk about some of those. Students see parts of it in the catalog in the schedule of classes. And so that's that's an audience that we need to care about. So whose responsibility is curriculum? And when I'm saying curriculum here, I'm talking about that formally approved you know, course outline of record through the curriculum committee, not just um, your assignments and course materials for your own course. Um, it is shared responsibility, but it is primarily faculty. So I don't wanna read the whole thing to you, but um, the Title V and the Chancellor's Office through PACA, the Program Course Approval Handbook, we call it the Curriculum Chicken, PACA, PACA, um, those give the, the um, Academic Senate purview over approving curriculum. And Academic Senate usually has a curriculum committee as a subcommittee. So that's run by faculty. Um, it is disciplined faculty people with expertise in the particular area or subject who are the content experts who actually put in all, all the content in the CORs, but it is approved by a cross-functional group. Every college has, sometimes they have their Senate approve it directly, but they all have curriculum committees is predominantly faculty, but it'll also include classified professionals, administrators, sometimes students. And so your role, if you're coming in here as disciplined faculty, like your role is to create it the best you can, but you do need to know that the curriculum committee has to come in and sometimes say, you didn't calculate units and hours correctly for compliance, or this is the wrong code, or you need to you know, validate these requisites. So you have, it is primarily faculty but there are other considerations for compliance. Uh, I think we're back to, now we're back to Brielle. Yes, thank you. So big picture, how is it different from a syllabus? Let's get to the nitty gritty, right? So um, Cornell last course outline of record is for the entire college, right? It's a college-wide document that applies to all instructors and sections for a given course, right? So anyone teaching that course across your college campus have to abide by the required sections of the COR. 
and you're typically the COR is, you know, internal facing, right? The syllabus is specific to an instructor in a particular section and is student facing more often than not, right? You share your syllabus typically the first day of school. You don't typically share the COR. Um, it contains, the syllabus contains things that you as an instructor or whomever is teaching the class want to distinguish as perhaps different from their colleagues or the way in which they sort of come and approach the topic. It's that sort of personalized way in which you get to exercise your academic freedom as an instructor. And, you know, the, the very specific details of your course, policies, dates, assignments, et cetera. Um, but it has to include those required elements of the COR, which include course title, description, um, the learning objectives, units and hours, and a couple other more items that we'll be going over later in the presentation. So that's the main difference. Um, both should be carried out beyond just a document that you share with students or just keep on your desktop somewhere. Right, both the COR and your syllabus should be uh, influencing how you actually teach and instruct your students. So, before we get into that detail of the COR, if we could advance to the next slide, um, we want to just talk a little bit about culturally responsive classroom practices because that's really what all of the information and the fine fine uh, print of the COR and syllabus should really um, service is how are you creating a classroom space that is culturally responsive and inclusive? And we just have a couple of bullet points of things to think about as you think about how that translates. So one would be um, shifting student-facing documents and descriptions focused on deficit-minded language to asset-minded language um, and decolonized language. So we mentioned earlier, words really matter. right? So that's not just words on the page, but words that are delivered in person. Um, and you know, something as simple as instead of saying um, minority students, minoritized students, right? The difference there is that they've been minoritized, right? That is something that has happened um, because of institutional oppression, right? So that tweak um, pro provides a little bit more inclusion um, and shows that you're being thoughtful about your word choice and how you think about how students are categorized, right? As an example. Um, we have a couple more examples coming up, but before we get to that, um, shifting language from impersonal verbiage to descriptive descriptions to <laughs> impersonal verbiage and descriptions to warm culturally responsive content. So thinking about the ways that um, you describe things for your students, um, instead of saying something like a high minority population, you would say richly diverse community, right? Um, definitely sounds like something that is a positive, something that is um, something to be celebrated when you say richly diverse community versus something uh, described as high, a high minority population, right? That's a pretty pretty stale description, if not maybe have some, having some negative connotations. Rewording language from a uh, colonized mindset to an equity mindset. And then Finally, collaborating with student services and faculty and classified professionals to prioritize student needs in a more hands-on holistic approach that addresses the entire student. So this goes beyond just thinking about what you say in your classroom, but how do you really lend support to your students and point them towards support elsewhere on campus if it's not something that uh, you directly can provide? So thinking beyond just your subject matter, beyond just what your students need from you, and think about what your students might need in the bigger context of being successful in achieving their academic goals, and really just finding an opportunity to feel like they're um, able to succeed and thrive wherever their lives may take them. So thinking truly about the whole student, um, and that involves pointing out services related to mental health, um, basic needs, um, food services you might have on campus. You know, it, it really is taking that local approach depending on where you're located and what sort of services your campus offers and what you know your, your students need. So just some things to be thinking about um, as far as how it's all gonna show up in the classroom. And I think I have just one more slide before we dig deeper into the COR, is that right? 
Mm -hmm. Yep. So just one more a set of examples um, comparing deficit language with student-centered language. Um, these slides will be available to you uh, and the recording of this presentation in a couple weeks or so on the CBC website. So I don't want to take up a bunch of time reading what's on this page, um, but hopefully you're getting a sense that words matter. And now we're going to talk about the words specifically in the COR and how they translate to DEIA. So before we shift gears a little bit and get um, kind of more in depth on the COR in particular, I just want to um, see just acknowledge that uh, uh, you're getting a lot of a uh, lot of positive comments, Brielle, in the chat. I don't know if you've been able to see how a lot of folks are relating to what you're saying. Um, were there any questions about um, distinguishing between uh, COR and and syllabi before we kind of jump into the COR? Um, you can use the chat. Can people unmute and talk? in this webinar format, they can or no? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. you could- Whatever you yeah. want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just waiting to see. I'm not seeing any hands up or anything in the chat. So I'm gonna keep going. It's not the last chance you have to ask questions. So you can, there'll be, we'll pause frequently because I'll need to drink water in between. <laughs> All right. So we are going to be looking at how the different parts of the required elements that again are, are laid out in Title V. Um, let's see, I am seeing people asking, will we get access to the slides after? Yes, the slides and a recording. Um, let me just pause for a second. And Heather Springer is saying, I'm on my college's curriculum committee and the language examples you provided were great. Someone asked at the last meeting, we aren't disciplined faculty, so we can't make these suggestions, can we? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a lot. I'm the curriculum chair at my college too. So we definitely will be talking about that. Actually, a lot of the slides that we're going over in the next section are ones that I developed to train my college's curriculum committee to start doing the work on the curriculum committee side. And then we got a few kind of early adopters who were willing to integrate DEI. And that's where you're going to see some more examples from my college. And then we went out and trained more faculty at the college. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely works in both directions. So we're going to be looking at different elements of the COR. So it's kind of a twofer, right? Because you can get familiar if you're not familiar with what the required elements of the course outline are. And then we'll be looking at where you can integrate um, DEIA throughout. So the first place that we're going to start with is usually the first thing on the COR and also the first thing students see about your class. And that's your course title and the description. And so those are things that at my college, we've been working really hard every time a course comes through. It doesn't matter if it's welding, if it's chemistry, if it's sociology, ethnic studies, um, what it is, we are looking at that title and that description and asking if it's descriptive, would a student really be able to tell what that was? You wanna actually make a student feel like you're inviting them in, not um, trying to sound fancy and using a lot of jargon. And so we've had a lot of classes that have revamped the language, um, even just things like using more complete sentences and saying, in this class, we will cover instead of a, a survey course of whatever, you know, you can make it sound more warm and inviting and inclusive. Um, again, trying to make sure that language is really clear, not using a lot of terminology that couldn't be understood through context. Um, sometimes in, in classes, if you have students where English isn't their first language, that can scare them away, even though the point of the class is to learn what those terms mean, but you put it in the description, that's an equity issue. And that's an issue about inclusivity. So that gets really important. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is consider about how particular groups, and in this case, Black and Indigenous and other people of color have been erased from curriculum. That doesn't mean that all of our courses are like, and by the way, PS, we'll talk about Black people too. That can be kind of awkward if you think about it that way. But we are trying to make sure that the wording that we're using explicitly lets students know this will be an inclusive class, right? Um, and I'm going to give you an example because I feel like that that helps. So this example is from my colleague, Manuel Rios, and he is one of our new uh, art instructors here. And he kind of jumped right into this curriculum work because he sort of inherited, we're a very small college. He's a one person department that never had a, a full-time faculty in years. So he inherited some really outdated curriculum. And one of the courses was an art history class and it used to be called History of Art One. So you wouldn't know as a student what that is. I won't read the whole thing, but when it, you're reading it, it's like art from Paleolithic period, early Christian world, 
pre-literate, pre-Columbian. And it's like, well, that's that's pretty centered around um, colonization. I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't really sound what it is supposed to be was global art history. You would never get that. Right. I'm like waiting to see if there's anything in the chat. You would never get that. So he rewrote it. He called it global in the title. He started with saying global art history and he specified the course will cover a range from around the world. And he took out terms like early Christian, which if you're an art history person, you know what that means. But if you're not an art history person, that can be off-putting, right? So that's just one example of how he changed it. You'll see more examples from his class for the other elements of the COR because he did a great job on it. Yeah, shout out to Manuel. All right, uh, let's see. The next part is a little less glamorous. Units and hours, that is a required element of the syllabus is very, I mean, of the COR and the syllabus, actually. It's a, it's very important. It kind of determines how many class meetings you have and how it's all set up and how many units the students get. Um, there are some equity ties here. So it's not as obvious about how it would be about diversity or inclusivity or anti-racism. But in terms of equity, um, sometimes faculty really, um, for all the right reasons, want to raise the units on a class so that students can have more time in the classroom. And that can have unintended consequences or unanticipated by the faculty consequences on financial aid, for example, um, taking more units than you need. It can make the class cost more money um, than it needs to. And so a lot of faculty who are just, we're going about our business teaching, we may not know all the ins and outs of how the Carnegie unit is calculated and the ratio of inside to outside of class hours and the difference between lecture and lab. This is all pretty technical stuff that we won't get into here, but your curriculum committee knows. And so curriculum committees can suggest this, or you can ask them um, to think about, there are ways sometimes maybe coding um, some of the course hours as lab gives you actually more hours in the class without raising the units and therefore the cost on students. Um, if you are having more units than what's recommended or what's kind of the standard for industry or transfer, are you actually doing some work to see if it has disproportionate impact? Because sometimes what I've seen in my own experience as curriculum chair is that, um, oh, uh, salty, Heather, ideally they understand, she said. Ideally your curriculum committee understands. Sorry, that distracted me, that's funny. They're supposed to understand. Um, you go to Curriculum Institute and learn. But what I've seen is that the, ex the exact groups of students that faculty think they're trying to help, sometimes using that deficit language, you know, um, unprepared students, those are the groups that are impacted the most negatively by increasing hours and stuff. So it's it's not the most um, maybe exciting topic in the world, but it's really important. And one thing is that a, a lot of folks don't don't understand how non-credit can be used to support um, other other kinds of courses. So uh, you can make mirrored courses. Our English for speakers of other language classes have non-credit options too, so that students can repeat it um, more than once for the the kind of entry level ESOL classes. And so asking those kinds of questions again, it's it's not exactly obvious to people that it's DEIA, but it, it absolutely is access and equity. All right. Let me go to the next one. It's going to be me presenting a few slides for a minute. So, <laughs> but Priya, I'll jump in if, you know, anytime. Um, conditions of enrollment, that's your prerequisites, your co-requisites, um, your, your advisories. Those ones are really important talking points that sometimes you as a faculty member will feel like, well, I'm the discipline expert. I want to, you know, put these, I want to put more requirements on because it will ensure that the student is successful. And what we find is it almost has the exact opposite. Now, there's all kinds of debate about this in math and English with AB 705, AB 1705. I'm not going to touch that right now. We're not going there. But it, it really is important that you look at your own classes or if you're on curriculum committee that you're looking at every class that comes through. Um, to look at barriers, ask if something, does something need to be a prerequisite that they have to have already completed before they enroll? Or could it be a co-requisite and a support course? Um, if you are doing that, is there disproportionate impact in how you're doing it? Have you been validating it? And don't forget advisories. At my college, I don't mean to call them out, but for years we had an advisory about being eligible for basically freshman comp, which doesn't make sense now with AB 705. But um, but they called it a language advisory. And many people interpreted that, that if you if you don't speak English as like, you know, really fluent in English, you can't take the course. 
And that's not what they were saying. So looking at the wording of how you do that, you can really scare students away. So making sure that you're um, disaggregating your data and looking at disproportionately impacted groups um, when you're when you're thinking about preparation, because sometimes, again, it's the opposite of what you're trying to do when you're thinking you're helping students. Um, the students that you might want to help most are the ones that are impacted the most negatively. Now, Heather's asking, what does it mean to validate limit limitations on enrollment? This is a, that's a whole note. You got to come to Curriculum Institute. We could talk about it more, but um, there are different ways to do that. You can do that by having um, checklists where you look at the objectives and content of the requisite course and show, kind of map them and show how they're needed to succeed in the course. Um, there's also statistical validation that, that um, colleges can do. Um, that one I can't get, I can't get into here, but there are ways to look at, you know, the numbers of students who, who, um, pass without that. If you're adding a new prerequisite, you can compare before and after data and then come back and look at it again in a few years. Hopefully that kind of answers the question. All right. I'm going to move on to course objectives and SLOs. And for this one, we'll have some examples from, from uh, my college again. For course objectives and SLOs, the reason we group these together, <clears throat> pardon me, is that we had course objectives and in, in uh, on the course outline of record objectives have been required for forever in our system. And then the buzzword started being student learning outcomes, SLOs. Right around the time I got hired, you know, in the early 2000s, we start talking about SLOs. ACCJC for accreditation is really focused on SLOs. Um, and Title V doesn't really talk about them. They talk about objectives. And so different colleges have kind of interpreted them differently. Are they interchangeable? CID kind of says, as long as it's in the objective or the SLO, we don't care as long as it's somewhere. Um, our college kind of views them as objectives or for the teacher, like a checklist of things you want to cover and outcomes are measurable, um, things that the students will be able to do. So I kind of group them together because your college may have defined these differently. Um, there's no inherently correct way to distinguish between an objective and, and the learning outcome. It sort of depends on your local process. But it is a good practice to consider thinking about whether you can add some very specific, explicit objectives or outcomes about diversity and or equity and or inclusivity, anti-racism. Um, you can add that. What we want to caution against, though, is you don't want like a boilerplate, like the curriculum committee approves sort of a generic outcome or objective that says this course will consider DEI. And then everybody puts it in because it's really key that it needs to be woven throughout. Um, it, it needs to be integrated in other places. Whatever's in the objectives and the outcomes has to like kind of organically emerge from what the actual content of the course is, right? So um, you don't just change the title of the course or just change the description. You're looking at the content, which we'll get to the outcomes, the objectives. When it's appropriate, adding an explicit one can be really helpful. And I have some examples on the next slide. Um, even in places where DEI content is not explicitly present. So I'm going to give the example of a welding class. And it's talking about different kinds of welds that you're going to learn. I can't even list them. That's not my area. Um, there's not going to be DEI content in that outline of this is what we're learning. It's not going to be there. Um, but it, it's sometimes, you know, so the outcomes may not reflect that. We'll get later to like, well, but maybe some of the assignments and methods of evaluation would. But um, even then, when you're reviewing your SLO, your student learning outcomes, the assessment data, disaggregating, you can be doing that equity work by just simply looking at your outcomes and seeing if it's working better for some populations of students than others. Even if the wording isn't exactly about DEIA, you can still be doing that work, right? Because um, it's not, not all of these ideas will work for every type of class. So some examples, and I won't read them all. Uh, I just have them on the screen for a minute. Um, our art faculty that you've already seen some examples from added a, an explicit SLO to that art history class as he was changing everything else. And what he put in is that the students would be able to, to do this analysis for at least three of the regions covered. And three is, I mean, it's arbitrary. We're not saying you have to say at least three. Um, but the idea that you're really putting in the outcomes that the students are expected to be able to, to do some global comparison um, and, and have a, a bigger uh, breadth of knowledge. Um, I think I see a hand up, Heather. Oh, 
sorry, it was uh, hard to unmute. Uh, real quick before you move on much further and I lose this question, um, some of the low hanging fruit that's happened in my space is that we've looked at the welding example. I'm going back to the welding example you just gave. We've mm -hmm. looked at like um, course materials to see if there's a OER resource that would then mm -hmm. be accepted. And, and that's sometimes, honestly, like that's all I can come up with. <laughs> yeah. If I'm, if I'm looking for DI and I'd like you to just weigh in on that. Like, is that enough? Should we be? Yeah. I don't know. Well, we're going to go through all the different parts so that will include a discussion about course materials. That's a good start. Um, but also methods of assessment. So I think by the time we get through this, you'll see that there are different ways where where you can approach it. Not every class is going to be as easy to like change every everything and make it so explicitly DEIA. But yeah, it's a good start. Definitely. All right, thank you. And, uh, Brielle is going to talk more about um, course materials and OER and and that in a little bit. That's a good a good tip. Um, so in these examples, putting explicitly that students would have to compare a certain number of regions or, you know, just making it explicit that there's going to be comparison, that there's going to be breadth. Um, again, adding that, that, you know, for an art SLO, contemporary art, this is actually a different class, but the same faculty member, that, that they weren't just going to talk about realist, abstract, and conceptual modern and contemporary art, but he explicitly put that word global in. And that prompts instructors who are teaching it and instructors who are assessing it to realize like, oh wait, am I really doing, am I, am I broad enough? Am I inclusive enough? Um, we also have an example from our administration of justice faculty member. She, um, she's she been a, a an advocate for this even before the call to action. Some of you may know um, laws change requiring implicit bias training to be embedded in these kinds of AJ classes for police officers. Um, actually real estate too, real estate classes, they have to cover like legally implicit bias now. But so she knew she was going to be adding it, but she wanted to make it a clear objective. So this one's a little bit, you know, wordy, but she wanted to really put it in clearly so that any of her part-time uh, faculty in her department who were teaching it understood like this really needs to be a priority. So some of these may be more, yeah, harder to envision in a welding class. And we'll get to other areas where you could do this kind of work if it doesn't fit to make an objective. Um, any other questions before I go to the next slide? I'm trying to watch the chat too. All right. So let's talk about course content because that's the real meat. You might wonder like, why didn't Neely talk about that first? Because I'm so immersed in this curriculum world that when I close my eyes, I visualize a course outline of record in the order that they usually come in. And usually it's the title and the description and you get the objectives and stuff before you get to the out, the topical outline is what it's called. So the course content is usually displayed at, in outline form as just a, you know, a list of subjects and topics. Some colleges... Um, actually go to the extra step of saying like how many course hours are spent on each topic and some don't. But that's usually the part of the COR that really, really does look like an outline. So in terms of course content, and we're saying here where appropriate, because it really, we are acknowledging everybody can do DEIA work with their students, but not everybody's going to have it as a bullet point in their course outline as a topic that they're going to lecture on, you know. Um, but when it's appropriate, you want to consider explicitly including it, um, acknowledging that there's going to be a debate that's covered, acknowledging that when you go over, I mean, I teach sociology and when we go over history, I actually have it as a bullet point. Like we're going to talk about, um, you know, some of the exclusions and the, the changes and the theoretical debates that have come since the discipline has become more open to women and people of color. And so you can, you can put that in there. And sometimes it prompts people who know that, you know, they know that stuff but they don't think, oh yeah, that would actually be useful to include. Sometimes we want to hide our dirty laundry, right? Like it's not great for me to sit there and talk about the, the problems um, in my field. My colleague who teaches psychology, it's like not that fun to talk about some of the darker history in the psychology field in terms of this stuff, but it's important for students to, to know that. Um, so including bullet points for that in your outline. Um, the language and the terminology that you use is so important. I, I revised my sociology of sex and gender class like five years after I wrote it because we have to revise them at least every five years. And, and it had only been five years and I'm the one who wrote it. And I was still shocked at how outdated the terminology was. Things can change fast. 
um, we had somebody doing a, a biology class with genetics and it had some wording in there that still sounded kind of eugenicist. Uh, you know, it, it was just outdated. And so making sure that that terminology, and I'll show an example on the next slide. And again, those marginalized experiences, I, I, I've been using OER for years and a lot of them are things that I kind of curate myself because I found like teaching a sociology of marriage and family class, it would be like, here's all these chapters about the family and marriage and children. And then it'd be like, you know, black families as like a little side, you know, absolutely marginalized, like a little separate section, like gay families, you know? Um, and we see that in course outlines too. So I think showing an example will be pretty helpful. Again, it's the global art history, just because you did such a good job. And I know that design-wise, this slide isn't the easiest to read. It's There's no test on it, right? You don't have to read every point. But just to highlight a few of the most important differences here, um, before, this was supposed to be a global art class, although it was called Art One. It was prehistoric, non-literate, non-Western. So that's othering, marginalizing, like what's put at the middle. You're just non. That's like calling women non-men. You know, don't do that. Um, Pre-Columbian. So again, centering it around Columbus. Um, and then you've got the Middle East. You've got the classical world. You've got early Christian art. Yes, I see Blythe has a hand up. Hi, thank you so Hi. much. Um, with this amount of evolution in a course, is it considered a revision or was it a full rewrite? Thank you. Well, it is considered a revision in the sense that the course number is the same. It's not a new course. It you know um, it gets resubmitted and checked for um, like GE. We revalidate GE when things come through anyway on a certain cycle. But it's not it's not considered a new course. So it is a rewrite, but to us a it's a big revision, right? A substantive revision. Um, so the after one, I don't want to, I want to be mindful of time because I know Brielle has some good stuff to go over and I've still got a few more slides. I want to make sure we leave time. Um, on the after side, what he really did, I mean, when you talk about moving away from the margins and centering it, he he took like here, non-literate, non-Western, African art is a sub, like sub bullet of non-literate, non-Western, and then all of Oceanic, right? All of Native American. So he split it by regions. He decided to list it alphabetically that you know, it's not necessarily in the order it would be covered in class, but these are the things. And he tried to really balance that. And that took some work, but he also was like, well, we do talk about these other things, but if you were to look at the first outline, it does not seem like global art, right? And that, and it, just to say that before was a class that was approved as global art by my college and it was accepted. And, you know, it, it transferred to UCs and CSUs, like people will take it. Um, at least they used to. So now, you know, we still, ha we have to push the envelope. We have to push it from our side, right? And update that language. All right. I think this is my my last couple of slides for a little bit, and then we'll let Brielle take it over for a while. Um, in terms of methods of evaluation and assignments, oh, Camille saying classics is a European-centered misnomer as well. There, it, yeah, that was a, that was a rough one. Um, our art teacher was like, oh, man, so what happens is a lot of times you come in and, it, you know, you, you're just teaching your classes and you don't really look at the busy work and the paperwork, right? You, so you think, well, who cares what it says? I'm not teaching it that way. Um, but you got you want to get it on that course outline. In terms of methods of evaluation and assignments, to kind of come back to that point about welding, is there something besides course materials, which Brielle will talk about next? Um, methods of evaluation and assignments is another really important way where we can talk about doing DEIA work where it's not necessarily a bullet point in, a, in the content. It's not necessarily a separate objective. Um, methods of evaluation, that's the type of assessments that could be done in the class. Uh, that's on the COR. What what are the types of appropriate ones? And four years in CID will look at it. If you're if you're saying the types of assessments and you don't have lab activities or you don't have a research paper for a certain kind of class, it can be denied equivalency or articulation. So in, it, typical assignments are included on there. That's so valuable um, to new professors or to our part time colleagues who are teaching at seven different places you know, like give, giving them like, this is how we do it here, right? These are some typical assignments that that are appropriate. Um, so looking at, you know, are the assignments listed aligning with the equitable content? 
Are there different types of formative and summative assignments? Are you measuring learning in different ways? Are you acknowledging that there's diversity in how people learn, right? Um, different learning and communication styles. Um, and then one point that I think is really important is a, looking at a uh, hidden curriculum, avoiding hidden curriculum. And some of you may be really familiar with that word, but when I talk about it, the way I define hidden curriculum is if you're grading students on something that is not in the course outline and is not something that you're teaching, then that's that's hidden curriculum and that's, that's an equity issue. And so, um, for example, in our sociology department, we don't have prerequisites for English classes. We took off advisories because we don't want English language learners to feel discouraged from taking our classes. We want to work with them. And so we don't grade on grammar and spelling on our assignments. In fact, we've come up with different ways to assess learning besides writing essays. So they write essays, but they can also do discussions where they can do videos. I mean, we have all different kinds of stuff. So I have some, um, oh, turning in work on time is hidden curriculum. Yeah, I mean, you can have equitable policies about about turning in work on time, too. I haven't thought of that as hidden curriculum, but I suppose you could include that in there. I'm going to just show this one is an example from my class. It's kind of. It's all a little bit emotional for me, honestly, it's kind of odd to share it with a group where I don't know most of you. But um, for years, I kind of really felt like I had this thing down, right? I mean, I social justice, I care about sociology, we teach about systemic racism, I teach class on race and gender, I teach Marx, you know, I teach the Communist Manifesto, I've like got this stuff down. And it really wasn't until COVID, um, like where I was teaching all these classes like on Zoom, and we were just all going through it together. I don't know, I can't even like get into like something shifted in me, where I just didn't have the heart to like not take late assignments, I didn't have the heart to like crack down on things. And I just realized like, what the hell am I doing? To be frank, I'm teaching in a way that worked for me as a student, but my students aren't always, you know, they don't come from the same background as I do. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching the way I've always been taught. So my course is like, I was using OER. I was, you know, teaching all the right content, but I was also using really traditional like lecture heavy. That's what I mean they couldn't talk at all, but lecture heavy. Uh, kind of like we are right now, just me talking for a long time, um, assignments and grading. I really prided myself on telling students like, look, you're allowed to have an opinion, but don't put it in your sociology assignment because you don't want me to grade you on your opinion. We're being objective. And the, and you can share your opinions, but not on the graded stuff. That's kind of where I was at. And I really thought that was the right way to be. And I've shifted my perspective. So I'm, if any of you are like that, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but it, I shifted my perspective um, on that a lot. And so since then, some of the changes I've made, lots more student, uh, opportunities for self-reflection. So I'm, I use Mentimeter at the beginning and end of any, uh, synchronous or in-person class. And I'm experimenting with ways to use Mentimeter in like a check-in at the beginning of a week in an asynchronous class, because you can embed the results slides. So when they click through, they can kind of see where all the other students are at. So anonymous opportunities, more group work, um, asking students more about the relevance of the readings and giving them credit on, on exams where there's a reflect and connect section. So we have a show what you know that's more like, what does this theory say? Or what is this evidence? And then there's a reflect and connect section that's worth quite a bit of points where they get to tell me how this connects or doesn't. And it shows a lot of critical thinking. I've learned so much. I've changed so much of my classes hearing students tell me what was meaningful to them and what wasn't, what made sense and what didn't. Um, and that may not work for every type of course, but the idea of it's not just what you're teaching, it's how you're teaching it, right? And so for courses like welding, what kind, are you having different kinds of assignments? You know, are you letting students um, see themselves in, in the work that you're doing? And I think that's probably a pretty good segue to the next slide, which we're gonna pass back uh, to Brielle about course materials. Thank you so much. Grab a sip of water. That was a lot. <laughs> um, and I want to just pause and thank you for sharing your experience and, and something sort of vulnerable about how you shifted your perspective. I think that the pandemic and teaching online and teaching in that, in that time, um, really did 
I hope open a lot of our eyes, right, to what is really happening in the home for students and how can we check in with them on that more holistic level, um, thinking beyond just our course topics. Um, and of course, how can we leverage teaching online in a way that makes it more accessible and inclusive um, for students. So um, with, with that in mind, course materials is, you know, is right up that same alley as far as thinking about how can you ensure that materials that you're providing to support your courses um, are accessible to everybody and not just accessible, but affordable. Um, and, and really, um, if there is a cost that it's manageable and that you're transparent about it, right? We talked about hidden curriculum, no hidden costs, right, in your courses. Um, and while that is something that is not, you know, necessarily required by the COR to inform the syllabus, the COR is where faculty often get the idea for what they're going to have in their syllabus. And you're planting seeds for faculty to think along the lines of inclusivity and DEIA um, when they think about their course materials. So when you think specifically about a, a textbook, right, would be the traditional example, is the text that you're requiring or suggesting um, ADA accessible or 508 compliant, right? For students that are relying perhaps on a screen reader um, who are visually impaired, who are hearing impaired, um, are they able to access this content? Is there an alternative text that is completely free of charge um, that they don't have to order um, and they don't have to purchase? If they have to purchase the textbook, can you spe specify that an earlier, cheaper edition or a used copy is okay? Or do they have to have that latest edition, right? Really think through those details and provide that information for students. We might think, oh, of course, they're just going to buy a used copy. But it might be helpful to give them that stated permission, right? Used copy is okay um, because we don't want to make those assumptions. Um what voices are represented in the text that you choose or the other materials that you provide. You know, one of the things that um, I really opened up to when I started teaching online, particularly during the pandemic was let's incorporate some videos, right? I used to kind of think of YouTube as like, oh my gosh, that's not academic, right? But there's so much good content and there's so many more diverse voices when you find, um, when you look beyond just traditional academic channels. So something like YouTube, you've got to vet the video, right? It's got to be captioned. You've got to have all of those check boxes, but you might find some really awesome content there. I also love assigning podcasts to my students, um, which in my mind are that much more accessible um, because typically if you find a podcast on like a big network, like NPR, not only do you have, um, you don't have to worry about video, it's just audio, but typically they've transcribed it for you as well. So you've got two modalities you can share that material. Um, so really thinking outside the box is really what I think we're encouraging you to do here. And again, thinking about accessibility, inclusivity. Um, another really great bonus to OER, like if you're using OER, um, like a really popular platform is Libre Text, text um, you can manipulate the content um, so you might find something on OER or in an OER platform um, that's missing a chapter or there's missing a little subsection of a particular chapter that you typically include. You can go find that from another source and sort of patchwork it in. You can edit things. Um, so you don't have to take them as they are. You can actually edit and customize them. Um, so it takes a little bit of work on the front end, but in the long end, it'll pay off. Um, just sort of an example, you know, because OER is not perfect, right? Um, if we could advance to the next slide, um, some of the, the content on um, those platforms might have inherently some bias in, its, in and of itself. So you want to look for that. This is just an example um, of a blurb of something that might come out of a biology text, perhaps in an OER context. Um, notice that we've got a picture of um, someone who appears to be um, white passing in high heels, very high heels, by the way. <laughs> um, and the blurb says, Cindy loves wearing high heels when she goes out at night, like the stiletto heels shown in figure 14.1. She knows that these are not the most practical shoes, but she likes how they look, et cetera, right? Um, we might just pass that through. But if we really want to take the DEIA lens 
And this is an OER piece of text. We can manipulate this. And if we advance to the next slide, what we could transform this to is a much more inclusive picture, right? Right away, we're seeing a couple of different people's feet, right? A couple of different groups represented. Um, and we change the blurb of it. Now we've got Amari who uses gender neutral pronouns and loves wearing high heels when they go out at night. We use this, we address this person by first name or those preferred pronouns throughout the example, right? Just a little tweak, but it really, really can go a long way. I think that if we just look at a side-by-side -side of these two slides, you feel differently when you look at them. And that is the kind of thing that we want um, we want to be able to do for our students. We don't want to show them the before, we want to show them the after and give them that more inclusive feeling. So just an example, um, when you're thinking about course materials, there's a lot of other examples. So if you're sort of stuck, please do keep the questions coming. I think we're down to just like our, our last slide of, um, of content. So if we could advance just once again, thinking about the instruction and um, modalities through which you teach is also something that um, can be influenced by the COR, not necessarily all required elements of the COR as far as it translates to the syllabus. But again, you want to hint for your faculty using the COR, how they should be thinking about um, instruction and uh, modalities of, of uh, instructing their students in that document. So uh, Neely addressed earlier, we want to be providing content that is supportive of multiple learning styles. And it's okay to say that right up front, right? Students should know that there isn't only one way to learn and that you are really um, empowering students no matter how they learn. And therefore you have a variety of methods, um, not only to share content, but for them to share their learning, right? And show what they've learned. So when appropriate, um, you wanna include a mix of lecture discussions and activities. Um, and you want to consider how all of those different modalities affect and impact students. So with the pandemic, I think um, <laughs> it's like there was like a pendulum that kind of swung a little too far at one point where like the whole conversation about teaching online was LTI, learning integration technologies, right? And like, how can we get Padlet in there? And how can we get Flipgrid and all these fancy tools that... Um, Yes, they did diversify the way in which students interacted with your class, but were they mobile friendly? Did students and, who- And are they hitting curriculum? Phone? What's that? And are they hitting curriculum, right? Because the more yeah. tools you have students use, if, you, if you're not prepared to give them really good, clear instructions on how to use the tool, it becomes part of the hidden curriculum, right? Absolutely, yeah. And if, and if students don't have a smartphone, right? Like, are they even able to get access to that? So- you want to be really mindful when you're thinking about what it means to create like diverse channels and diverse modalities, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to get the most cutting edge technology, right? Because that probably isn't the most accessible. And for students that might be that not tech uh, technologically literate, um, it's a it's a hidden curriculum piece. So it is going to require some thinking and strategy. And depending on what you teach, there's going to be different tools available to you. Um, if you're not sure what's available to you, definitely reach out to us or a colleague uh, because um, the needle has moved quite a bit thanks to the pandemic and the push in online education. Um, so hopefully we can find different things out there for you um, if you're not already aware of them. But the big point, the bigger point is think about how instruction, uh, methods of instruction and modalities and DE modalities are articulated in the COR so that faculty are really empowered to find inclusive technologies and inclusive methods when they are designing their specific course and writing their syllabi. Um, really open the, open the door for them to think really critically about what will best serve their students. And I think that's the main, the last uh, main topic that we had covered for you today. Um, we want to advance one more slide. I just want to be sure because I'm I'm second guessing myself. <laughs> You're right. Yes. You can talk about these references there. Yeah. So um, here is a list of our references and different um, sources that we use to put together this slide. I really want to thank Neely for putting so much of this together. As I'm sure you could tell from the way she spoke 
about her experience with Academic Senate. Um, she is a wealth of knowledge on this particular topic. My experience is much more on the syllabus. Um, and so I just want to first note Neely as a reference, um, because I know I learned a lot just for putting this together with you. Um, and together, um, we also relied a lot on the, these great resources that we have. Um, and if there's folks in the room that um, are also thinking more now about their syllabus, right? We focused on the COR today. We gave you some examples of how it translates to the syllabus. But if you are interested specifically in syllabi and how to make that document more um, diverse, diverse, uh, supportive of di diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. I want to invite you to the CVC at One website where we have a recording of a previous webinar a couple weeks ago, creating an equitable syllabus, which I led with another colleague um, here in our community college system. Um, so just know that that's that second to last bullet there. If you want to hear about how this conversation fits in the context specifically of syllabi, that is a great place for you. And all of these resources are really wonderful and worth taking a look at. Um, anything you want to add to that, Neely? There's a, there's a comment in the chat. It says, can you please talk about a bit about the limits of CID imposes on our course outline and what changes we can make that won't cause issues with getting accepted through CID? Thank you. Uh, I, I can't, I'm, I, I don't want to promise that I, I mean, I don't officially speak for CID, right? So I just want to be clear about that, but the CID course descriptors. So those are the standardized descriptors. If you want your course to be accepted as part of model curriculum, transfer model curriculum for ADTs or model curriculum for career technical work. So it's a, it's a joint partnership between CSU and community college where they get uh, discipline experts in the field from, from both systems to review a course and see if it meets minimum standards. So in a sense, it's kind of similar to what we're saying about the COR, like it has to include the things on the COR and you can add more. And so if CID does say it needs to be a three unit lecture and one unit lab class, that's a minimum standard, you have to do that. If you want to add more units, you can, but as we were saying, be, be cautious about doing it. So you need to make sure you have alignment um, my understanding is reviewers don't actually want to see a carbon copy of the descriptor. It's not a fully fleshed out class. It doesn't have all the required elements of a COR. So if you are if you are doing the DEI work uh, and you're worried that it's going to impact CID, I mean, as, as long as you have sort of those minimum standards in there, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is textbooks. Sometimes the CID descriptor will have a list of textbooks and you want to add OER. Um, at our college, we've worked around it by adding some of the, the textbooks from the CID list and saying or equivalent, and then also adding the OER um, option. So that ways to work around it. You do want to be cautious. Uh, nobody's brought it up yet, so I'll just drop the stink bomb in the room, which is that common course numbering is coming, and that's going to bring a lot of other standardization, and we don't really know what that's going to look like yet, but I will tell you that at, at the level of the Chancellor's Office um, and ASCCC, they are acknowledging that the DEI work that we're encouraging faculty to do needs to be reflected in what wherever we go with common course numbering down the line but it's too soon to say anything about what that's going to look like. So it's worth doing the work now uh, while we're waiting for guidance. I don't know, Suzanne, did that, did that answer your question enough about CID? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Um, it was mostly, I think our college gets really tied into you have to stick with what they're giving you. So I, I just was hoping for an okay to say, no, we can branch out a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think it comes straight from CID itself that they don't want you to just that that is the minimum and they want you to build on it because if you look at those cid descriptors they're they're not really fleshed out you've got to put more in so um again if, if they're saying you have to have a certain prerequisite on the course to align then you do have to have that right uh but you can you can add more for sure and especially around outcomes course materials content itself they want to see it more fleshed out than what's in the descriptor Fabulous. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Do we want to do the, the, we won't call it exit surveys because we're hoping to have more conversation and not quite exit yet, but let's see. So we've got, if you're already in and it just says waiting for me to advance slide, it's the same code as before. If you still have it up, uh, I'm going to leave that up for just a second. And then 
I will advance the slide. So hopefully I will do this well. <laughs> okay, let's do, we have a learning outcomes poll. And I should be able to get us to that. And now it should, it might be a little bit of a lag, but now you should be able to um, answer the next question in there. So the code's still on the screen if you need it. And it looks like it's working for at least one person. Uh, but we have a, we have a, a couple of other slides where we can, we're going to ask for some more specific feedback from you all and have more discussion if folks want it. This part's a little nerve wracking to do, right? We're getting it evaluated right in front of our, our faces, but so far folks are being kind. All right. I'm going to leave that up for a little bit and then we're going to advance the slide and ask you to brainstorm some things. And I'll leave it just a little longer until I see that number stop. I mean, that's not quite as many people that are participating, but obviously it's voluntary. So we kind of get the idea here. I think I'm going to advance the slide at this point because we're seeing that it's a um, pretty pretty good outcome. So glad to hear it. What we'd like to have from you uh, here, and so hopefully when I've advanced the slides, you're able to come in and now you can brainstorm. We'd like to just get a sense of an idea. I mean, you can, I think it's set so you can enter more than one or you can enter something long, but at least one idea. Is there anything that you think you would take away from the webinar that you could take back to your, your college or use in your own um, courses? And then we also just want people to feel free to talk at this point. And we'll have another slide for the questions you still have. So hang on to those. We'll get those too. Um, and I don't know, Brielle, do you want to facilitate some discussion around these as they pop up or? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I think that um, it's very obvious that the, the tank hole message for a lot of people, as I think it was stated a lot by us, is that language really matters, right? In your COR, um, in your syllabus and how you deliver content uh, to your students directly. So I'm glad that that hit home. Um, words matter. I'm a communication scholar. So of course I'm in agreement. Um, seeing some other uh, notes here about specifically where and how they can you can revise the COR with DIA in mind. Glad that that came through. Um, again, these are um, big picture ideas and examples, but if you have really specific or detailed questions that you'd like to provide um, or ask us, I'm, I'm going to put my email in the chat um, in case I can be a resource to you. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out because we know that in the abstract, these things can make sense. And then you go and you're looking at your specific COR and you're trying to edit it and you're like, wait, what? How do I actually tackle my subject matter? Right. Um, thank you for providing your email as well. Um, and again, we, um, we do have a couple of minutes here before we have to wrap up. So if anybody would like to speak, um, please raise your hand and you can come off mute. We'd love to hear from you or continue to populate questions in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to advance to the next slide where they can put in questions too, unless oh, folks great. want, want a chance to look at more of these. Cause I think we've got more responses than what what we're seeing so hmm. i'm going to yeah, move to the next slide cool yeah sorry folks. if you still want to, you can you can put your ideas to take away in this slide too if you if i cut you off um but what questions you still have i mean you can obviously ask some of us but this is also something we can um share although you have your own survey for the cbc at one webinar um we'll also make sure that any questions here get passed on did it not work Oh, no, it worked. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the thumbs up. Now we know. And then, but yes, yeah, still, we, people should also talk too. I didn't mean to cut off the conversation. Mm, helping faculty that only use a classic textbook. Do you have experience with that, Lily, and encouraging faculty um, to think outside the box? Yeah, I mean, luckily for us, the 
departments where we have that, there's usually an adopter. And so we have the, or we have the options on the COR at least. Um, and yeah, when we have faculty that won't do it, I mean, we, we list which courses are zero textbook costs and which ones are low textbook costs. And that's moving the needle more than anything because the students are the ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if your college isn't already um, indicating in the schedule which classes are, are um, OER or ZTC, zero textbook cost, you should advocate for that. That, that helps a lot. Uh, I see the one about STEM and not much diversity in our textbook content. Uh, uh, content. So one of the things is if, if you can use OER, then you can change the pictures, you can change some of the topics, you can add to that. Um, if, if you don't, I mean, I just recommend OER for that purpose, but um, supplementary. So we have a, um, a chemistry professor at our college who um, she does a couple of things. She, I mean, she, I don't know if she's using OER, but she has extra handouts that she's curated and little extra projects on um, chemists, famous oh, chemists of color, women chemists that she adds if, if she needs to supplement the book. She just creates additional assignments. And one of the things she does that I think is so cool, she, uh, when the students do their first lab, she gets pictures of them all in their, in their lab gear. And a lot of our students were a Hispanic serving institution. A lot of our students are students of color, or women, you know, first gen college students. And then she uses those pictures to um, put in her slide, her lecture slides, so that when she's illustrating what a scientist looks like, it's the students. That's Michelle Dykus at Woodland Community College. Pretty cool, right? So, I mean, there are ways to increase uh, representation. If you can't switch the book, you can supplement it or you can do it through your lecture materials. I don't know if Brielle has other, other thoughts on that or... No, I think that, those are great tips. Um, yeah, I had mentioned before, you know, using some of those external resources that are out there now, um, YouTube and TED Talks. Um, I'm not sure how much STEM is represented in those platforms or um, podcasts, but those are other supplemental resources that you can certainly use um, in conjunction with your textbooks to, you know, add some new voices to the conversation. Yeah, that's it, right? Who, who are writing those old textbooks? That's exactly it. Um, I see one about walkthrough of how curriculum committee works and the steps to submit and advocate. And I don't know that we really have time to do that here. So maybe that's a request from CBC, but I'll also give a shout out to the curriculum institute that ASCCC puts on every summer. It's their largest institute and they welcome curriculum experts all the way down to brand newbies and you learn all of all of that stuff. Um, so that's one option. Um, in terms of non-credit, uh, I think every college is a little different. My college is really starting to embrace it uh, for support courses around AB 705 and for mirrored courses and things that can't be repeatable, but community members might, might want to take a bunch. So we have like, you know, um, music classes, ensemble music classes that are non-credit mirrored so that community members, it falls under courses for older adults, uh, that they can take these classes. So uh, I mean how to incorporate them. Again, we there's a non-credit institute coming up, right? I think like next month, next week. Does anybody know? If anybody knows, put it in the chat. There's a whole institute, there's a whole like conference on non-credit ideas. Curriculum Institute includes it as well. And I am, I'm guessing CVC is getting the message. Maybe they'll have something on that too. Who knows? Um, I want to um, also address a comment about how to get people on board who still do not see DEIA as relevant to their work. Um, that can be tough, right? Um, I am working with a department right now that's sort of in a similar place and we have like no budget. And so <laughs> we're really trying to think about like, how do we just get people first to think about who they are and maybe start to think about places in which they have privilege. And so there's two tools that we've used um, that are just online free tools. Um, one is um, there's something called the positionality wheel, um, which um, is, is not a soft topic, but this um, specific text that I put just in the chat now um, does introduce it um, and provide some context for how people can see themselves represented on the positionality wheel. And a follow-up question after people have had a chance to say, okay, where, where, where do I have privilege? Where do I maybe feel marginalized or have I been marginalized truly? Um, is where do you think your students fit on this or your campus at large? 
right? And thinking about how those may differ or may look the same could illuminate that conversation. And then another thing I don't actually have a, a quick link for, but it's an easy Google search is um, implicit bias um, surveys, right? Giving people an opportunity to do a self um, a self assessment. Um, can be illuminating. They have to be honest, of course, but even just confronting the questions in those self-assessments, I don't know how many of you have done them before, you can feel things internally, right? Even if you don't mark something accurately, you know when you kind of lied. You're like, actually, you know what? Maybe sometimes I, I do behave in this way or I do perceive people in this way. And that can just get people to start opening up to the conversation more. So just some free tools to think about, but I would really ask to get some institutional support from the rest of your department to see how you can bring people um, into the conversation more and, and find out what questions they have. I, I would add to that. I mean, I, I'm of two minds about it really, because on the one hand, um, part of me wants to say, if you know, if somebody doesn't get it too bad, it's probably going to be written into Title V that you have to and get with the times. You know, I don't want to soften any message or like tiptoe around the people that are uncomfortable because, you know, my priority is that my students are comfortable. You know, that's the first priority. That's that's what matters. On the other hand, I will say that I find that sort of a gateway to DEI work is is talking about. Um, doing workshops on hidden curriculum and really focusing on like course policies uh, and language and kind of not even mentioning DEIA at first because it's become such a politicized buzzword for some people that they just shut down. And so talk, talking about it from that in that uh, in that way and asking asking folks to um, kind of look through their their syllabi and see what policies are like, what are you grading on and where does it show in the course outline of record that you teach that and and doing it that way. So that can be interesting. Um, I do want to be mindful of time because we do have one more slide uh, for the for the CVC, and I see um, we should probably move to that. But I I want to acknowledge to the question about um, STEM faculty needing help. Um, I actually asked one of my colleagues that question because she had presented like all this amazing stuff she did. Uh, one of our biology professors, Danny Crane, who doesn't work at our college anymore, she got a full time job, and she said, "I just started reading and I looked for it." So if you find the folks that are willing to push this forward and do that, encourage them. I mean, what I've done is I've created a Canvas space for my department with all kinds of resources. And when you make it easy, then the more hesitant folks might adopt it. I need to get back into the slide, apologies, so that we have that last one. And then... Thank you all so much. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful webinar. And I see from the comments. Everyone really enjoyed it and learned so much. Um, again, a reminder, if you haven't completed the survey, please do so. It's very helpful for us to create programming that is more suited to your needs. Um, and uh, we hope that you register um, for any future webinars that we have. You can check them out on the website and they, the link has been dropped. Thank you, Sochi, for dropping that. Um, and then lastly, um, the webinar and associated slides will be available on our at one webinar site. Um, please give a few days for that to be posted. Thank you all so much. We have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Take care. Have a great weekend.